close to having the happiest show of the season here on the James Whitford Show. Welcome into our WIPB studios, Joel Gadet and the head coach James Whitford. It's an 0-2 week, but two really competitive games, one mm. that goes to three overtimes, and then mm. you head on the road and take the best team in this conference to the wire. Yeah, two, uh, two tough games, and um, you know, I had a chance to win both. And uh, going to Toledo, I think, without Majok, without Kenny Crowder, I thought our guys gave a great effort. Let's start with the Central Michigan game, though, and that was the three-overtime game and, mm -hmm. and kind of the marathon of it that set the tone for the week. Before we get to that, though, it's the first time Ball State had played a three-overtime game since 2000. The Cardinals played back-to-back triple-overtime games back in the 2000 season. They lost on the road at Eastern Michigan, then they lost on the road at Miami. Mm -hmm. So you've been a part now of the last two three-overtime games that this team has played, and uh, look at that starting lineup, and uh, that guy <laughs> yeah. is your assistant, Jason Grunkemeyer. It's an interesting cast of characters. Mickey Hosier was on that team. Yeah. Ray McCallum was the Ball State head coach back then. This was a game that uh, had some interesting twists and turns. Jason Grunkemeyer with the three here to get it going early. He did a lot of that, and then I'll let you take us through what happens on the next play here as a little bit of a, a fisticuffs breaks out. Now, I remember this well. Dwayne Clemens and Ben Helmers got into a little uh, shoving match on the ground right there, and you can see <laughs> it got it, it got I'm sorry with Cedric Mumudi I, I was uh, obviously right there with Cedric Moody not Dwayne Clemens they got in a little shoving match and it got heated and, and uh, amped up the, the competitiveness guy on the right looked familiar there yeah he did I was uh, a little bit younger back then but uh, I was there I was on the Miami bench 21 seconds left in that game Dwayne Clemens with the charge coal sets Miami up and Jason Grunkemeyer, this guy's got ice water in his veins. Yeah, he had a knack for hitting big shots in his entire career, and that was obviously a huge one right there uh, to tie the game. Heave yeah. there at the end of regulation. Let's fast forward very quickly to the uh, end of the first overtime as well. This was a lot of Dwayne Clemens. I know when you got this job, you talked a lot about your nightmares of him. He had a, he had a lot of opportunities in this game. Slips in the final eight seconds of the first overtime, but uh, I think he had 22 for the game. Now, he was a heck of a player, and uh, I, I remember him going, getting in the lane and creating so many problems for us over the years. Rafilowe Latunia. This one's got to haunt you if you don't win the game. End yeah. of the second overtime. Yeah, had a chance to win it right here, and, uh, and uh, went to the line to shoot two. Didn't make it, and, uh, but fortunately, we, we pulled it out there in the third one. Watch the second missed free throw. This will go right into a Dwayne Clemens miss. With five seconds left, still had the opportunity. This is how overtime number two comes to a close. That's a pretty darn good look. You can see how fast he is. I mean, he just, he's really hard to keep out of the lane. This, this was a heck of a game and one we'll all remember for a long time. All right, let's walk through the, uh, the end of this thing. We mentioned Jason Grunkemeyer, of course, an assistant on your staff now. Big shot. <laughs> He could really shoot the ball. You saw Rob Mestis found him off a dribble penetration, and uh, that was a big shot, gave us a big lead. Goes from that to Dwayne Clemens at the free throw line to tie things up in the closing seconds. He does just that, 84 all. And then Anthony Taylor, who had 28 points in this game, played 53 minutes. Maybe the fatigue was setting in. We'll call this an assist for uh, Latunia. Yeah, it's amazing <laughs> how much offensive rebounds in close games like that. It's almost always not the first shot, it's often the second, and that was a big offensive rebound. 86-84 was the final score back in 2000. By the way, this video was from 2000. Yeah, <laughs> it's really like It shows you the rivalry between the two teams well, and how competitive it's been. It shows you how technology has come, because I felt like I was watching a game from 19, 1972, because right. now, I mean, it's amazing what we're going to be talking about in 2024. Yeah. Right. Uh, let's go from that, though, to the Central Michigan game. The three overtimes of that one, it was a game that you guys controlled. They yep. didn't lead until overtime. Right. And uh, it really, we'll, we'll see it, it came down to some final cr uh, crucial plays. Yeah, we played a, a good game for really 39 and a half minutes. You know, we, we thought we controlled the game. We handled the press really well. We led, like you mentioned, for the majority of the game. And uh, unfortunately, they banged three big threes late to tie it up. You went into it. There was a little bit of concern about pressure. We'll see some of you guys breaking the pressure early. Mm -hmm. How'd you feel you dealt with that? Because I know that was that, that's been an issue at times. And we dealt with it terrific. I mean, it, we 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 uh, we turned the ball over one time against the press, but we broke it and scored a number of times, and uh, we were able to take advantage of it to the point where they pulled the press off. And um, I thought that was that was a sign of growth. It was really three straight games that the other team has had to pull the press off against us. Also, one of the concerns going in was the interior defense, and I don't want to say concern. That was one of those kind of 
benchmarks, what you wanted to do. You wanted to attack them inside mm -hmm. because they don't have big physical post presences. And first two plays we'll see here come off of getting it inside. Franco House with the kick. Yep. And then we'll see Majuk Majuk with a layup early as well. You guys ran out to a 15-4 lead, so you really had things going early. We did, and like you mentioned, we got the ball inside early. That was the plan as the game went on. We got away from that too much. And then um, I felt like in the end of the game, we we uh, kind of got away from the game plan of trying to get it inside. If I told you Kendon Crowder had a, a steal six that forced a timeout. I believe it. At this <laughs> point, he's doing it. He's, it's one of the things he does well. Xavier Turner, again, yeah. you get inside, yep. collapse, kick out. That's how you have to attack that the way they play, is get the ball in and either get it in and score or back in and out. Talked about breaking the press. That's a pretty easy way to do it. Yeah, it's, that's what we want to do against pressure. We want to we want to attack it to score. Chris Brond had the press break there with the layup, and then Xavier Turner, shot clock awareness here for a freshman, winds down, and with a couple seconds left, little floater. That floater is something he's been really working on because of his size. It's an important shot for him, and he's he's getting better at it as you can tell. Talk about breaking the press. The dunk versus the press is always a fun way to do it. Mm -hmm. And then Franco House, final. Play of the first half that we'll show you. Nice little backdoor feed from Bo Calhoun. Yeah, a couple good passes by Bo in this game, and uh, it was good to see. Jesse Berry to start off the second half. This, I believe, is the definition of a shot fake. Uh, we'll take a look at JB in this game, plays 52 minutes, scores 19 points, and boy, does Central Michigan buy this one. On the uh, baseline out of bounds, look at Hibbets fly. Yeah. Shows you Hibbets can get up, but no good shot fake by Jesse. They chased him off the line, and that's how you take advantage of a defender trying to block your three-point shot. You said Xavier had been working on the floater. Franco's been working on the 17-footer. We've seen him stretch it to threes, but mm -hmm. there's what he's actually been working on. That's what the defense has been giving him, so it's important he takes it, because uh, otherwise, you know, they're, he's letting his defender be what we call a fifth defender on everybody else. They still give it to him. Mm -hmm. You can even see Simons hedge out and say, no, I'm good. <laughs> Yep, big shot for Franco and, and put us with a seven point lead in the second half was key part. I know Xavier is an elite three point shooter. I mean, that's not a lot of space and it's a deep shot. Yeah, it's a deep shot. That's, he's made that one all year. He's about 40% from behind the arc. One of two steals for uh, the cards in this game comes on Chris Bond, or I guess, well, call that a steal. Pick it up off yeah, the ground and pick go. Pick it up off the floor and go coast to coast. And it, uh, and it results in the Cardinals edging out to a three point lead in the final two minutes of this thing. Xavier Turner, nice baseline pass to Bond. Cards up by five at this point, and now up by seven in the final 36 seconds. Walk me through Blake Hibbets. Well, Blake Hibbets, you see get one there off the dribble flip, and now it's a four-point game. We have five guards in here, and we make the mistake of running in to try to block his shot. The two-point shot wouldn't have beat us. It was the three that we had to defend, and that was a big mistake and a learning experience for us. How much of a factor did Chris Fowler's impact become late in this game? Because their point guard is all-conference, one of the better point guards in the mm -hmm. league, and it seemed like there were so many guys chasing him. Yeah, that, he's a great passer, and if you uh, if you let him, you know, he's actually the most dangerous as a passer, more so than he is as a scorer, despite him leading the conference in scoring. So he, uh, he can get a ton of assists. Go to the first overtime, which was a slow one. Central's other win in conference, there were 29 points in the first and only overtime. Here there were just 12, and 77-77 is where overtime number one ended. They had their first lead, so you guys had to respond to adversity for the first time, mm -hmm. and then in the second overtime, you do it again. Yeah, we did. We caught up, and we actually had another shot to win it here in the second overtime. And, and I had two cracks to win it, one regulation, one in the second overtime. And third overtime uh, is when it started to get away from us. Ray, uh, Raylan, Rayshon. Rayshon Brayson. It's a tongue twister. Uh, he goes for 12 in the third overtime. He does, and he really had a coming out party. And here was a ice on him one on one. And first time he went to the rim, second time he stepped back and got a three. He picked the right time to get hot and, and uh, really went, took the team on his shoulders and won the game for him. So our final score 101 95. Braylon Rayson, by the way, I have it written backwards, Rayson Braylon. That's why uh -huh. it didn't make any sense. Um, Central Michigan gets the victory there. It became a battle of attrition as well. There were nine players in the game that had four fouls. We mm -hmm. talked about this on the radio last night. It becomes difficult to play when you've got to worry about yeah. what you're doing. Guys get worried about foul trouble, and what often happens is you start playing in uh, weird lineups. You know, you're, you're playing your power forward at the center spot. You're, at that point, we were actually playing five perimeter players. Uh, for a stretch, we were playing Mark Allstork at the four and, and uh, essentially Chris Bond at the five. So it was guys were in un unfamiliar roles, to say the least. You go from that with an extra day to bounce back. So you have mm -hmm. the recovery built in because you don't play Toledo until Sunday. 
Um, and that's a difficult game because, as we mentioned off the top, you're without Majuk, mm. you're without Kinden, who mm. hurts his ankle in practice. You've got to go on the road, and you performed very well against probably the best team in this league right now. Yeah, I, I was proud of uh, Medin and uh, Bo. You know, they stepped up and did a good job. We actually played Franco at the five a little bit and uh, made us, in some respects, hard to guard on offense because we were we were diverse. Uh, we were small inside defensively, but we, we guys we came out and attacked and, and uh, put up a lot of points and gave Toledo a run for their money. You guys win the rebounding battle in this game, even without Mashuk, 35-30. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because it was across the board. Mm -hmm. Guards rebounded too, and you've talked about guard rebounding. Mm -hmm. Everybody who played in the game outside Xavier Turner had a rebound. Yeah, and that, that was a sign to me of how hard we played. I thought our guys really competed. Toledo is one of those teams. They rebound from all five positions. You know, they're shooting guard, they're small forward, they offensive rebound. So in that game, it was a real big emphasis for us, and, uh, and our guys stepped up and answered the, answered the bell. Cardinals came out early in this one. Ball State went out to an early lead as well. We start with Chris Bond, a little drive and score here. Deadlocked early, and uh, this gives you the early two-point advantage. CB played excellent in this game, 22 points. He eclipsed 1,000 for his career as well, 8 of 13 from the field. And then where do the best three-pointers come? Offensive Off rebounds. rebounds, no question, because the, the defenders are always under the rim, so if it's a long rebound, we're always taught to look out. Jesse Berry, this one not off the offensive rebound, but a, a nice little slight screen from Bo Calhoun. Mm -hmm. Did a great job clipping him on the flare. Jesse came off, got his feet set, good shot for him. Franco House, we talk about him having to kind of go at it on the interior. He really went at it. He did, and it's one of the things he's getting better at. You know, early on, I felt like he was he was uh, playing too timid on the offensive end, and now he's gotten more aggressive. He's He's uh, looking to score, create contact, get to the foul line. Nice little behind the back or mm -hmm. drop off pass from Barry to Chris Bond out in transition. They crash the glass. They're not all back. You're able uh, to get down in transition. It was a good push. And there you can see, even though he missed a shot, Chris Bond has gotten so good at getting to the rim and is really uh, playing good basketball. Had our first Mading sighting there. Three offensive boards for Mading Thok in this basketball game. And then Jesse Barry, this is just one on one. I'm going to shoot it over you. Yeah, it was a tough shot. He was feeling a little bit there in the first half, and a uh, big shot to keep it closer. Brings it to a two-point game at that juncture. Toledo did stretch it at the break a little bit. Goes into the halftime with that 11-point lead, but it's a challenge for you guys to respond. And in the second half, you did exactly that. And we start with Chris Bond. Talk about offensive rebounds. Uh, you get another one of them here as Turner gets it to CB, and then, you know, Shooter knows how it's coming off. Look at him follow. Yeah, CB played a great game and uh, his back-to-back -back career highs. So it really kind of shows you where he's at playing really good basketball and, and uh, hopefully we can ride it here for a few wins down the stretch. More Mading underneath, 12 points. He had 10 all season coming in, having to play big minutes, 18 of them for the injured Majuk Majuk. And then uh, out into the corner for CB, another three from him. Todd Kowalczyk said he's one of his favorite guys in the league because of that. He went from not being a skilled guy to being a skilled guy, has worked on his game. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with him. He's, CB worked very hard on his game over the summer and uh, has really, really developed as a player. And honestly, he's just, in my opinion, scratching the surface of where he can be as a player. He can be a much better player than he is today in a couple years. More Chris Bond. They lost him in transition for the three. And then Jesse Berry comes back with another three. At this point, you're all tied in Toledo. You've got to feel pretty good. A little more than eight minutes left, all knotted up. Yeah, we felt we. I felt like we really had a chance to win. It's one of the things we talked about. A lot of these games, uh, we haven't been able to close out, and that, that time is on our side. We got to stay with it, and you know, we had a chance to get this one in our corner. It was a three-point game with about three to go. Mading, how do you lose Mading around the rim? It was off of a ball screen, and he did a good job running to the rim. And, and uh, the best thing I can say about Mading is he did the little things right. He didn't dribble. He didn't bring the ball down. He didn't uh, do the things he doesn't do well. Chris Bond, final bucket there. That was his 1,000 and 1,000 and first career points. But the final score, again, Toledo comes out victorious 85-74. Our mutual bank leading scores. We've talked about Bond and, uh, and Barry's performance. And Mading Thok gets some love on the uh, scoreboard to uh, finish out the week for the first time in his career. You guys roll from that, though, and, and we talked about this on the radio last night. It comes down to those winning time moments, and it's that mm -hmm. chicken or egg argument because mm -hmm. you need to win to learn how to win, mm -hmm. and you need to learn how to win to win. Right. So you kind of have to figure out which one happens first. Yeah, we did. Well, we, you know, we have to work on those moments in practice, which we've been doing, and um, and, and each, each time the situation is a little bit different. You know, in the Central Michigan game, we, uh, we scored the ball really well during the course of the game, couldn't get key stops. In the Toledo game, it was actually more the same. Other games, it's been the, been the uh, reverse, haven't been able to hit the big basket late. But 
Toledo scored the ball too much in the final three and a half minutes. We, we, were, we were good enough on offense to win. Well, what the Cardinals also do to prepare themselves for those situations, they've got a really good strength and conditioning program. You want to be the better conditioned team on the mm. floor in late game situations. This week on the program, we headed into the weight room. You guys still lift during the season, so you have to stay strong, even though you're playing and practicing mm. six days a week. We went behind the scenes with Jason Roberson, the Cardinals strength and conditioning coach, to see what they go through, especially in season while lifting weights. Good, man. Get tall, tall, tall. There you go. Good. Good. Chest up on the squats. Excellent. I'm the director of strength conditioning for Olympic sports. That's everything except football. Uh, my job is to make sure the athletes are strong, powerful, and capable of being athletic. Uh, that which includes movement skills, things of that nature. So we teach them how to run, we teach them how to run quickly, we teach them how to change direction, and we teach them how to absorb landings and things of that nature. When I first got into the world into strength conditioning around 2000, uh, most programs were, you know, you come in the weight room, you do some core, you maybe do some arms, then you get out. Um, nowadays we're seeing that it's really important to make sure their hips, legs, and backs are really strong. And so we still squat, we still do our Olympic movements, which is snatch and clean and jerk. Um, we still do a lot of deadlifting. Right now we're in the middle of the season, so I'm trying to improve power or just at least maintain power by doing lots of exercises that require them to push really fast, really hard. Um, we're not necessarily going to pick up really, really heavy weights at this point in time. If they're a guy that sees 25, 30 minutes a game, I'm going to see them definitely two days a week. Uh, if they're a guy yeah, that sees on, five, ten minutes a, day, a game, then I'm going to see them three days a week. Uh, and then there's some guys that yeah. are still, you know, still trying to work in that lineup, and I'll see them four days a week. First thing they do when they come in the room is we do what's called foam rolling. It's just a self-massage. Uh, what we want to try to do is make sure we work out any knots, any um, build-ups, things of that nature, to make sure the muscles work properly. Uh, the second thing they're going to do is get into their Olympic movement, which can be a snatch or a clean, and that's that power movement. I want it to be explosive, work really, really fast. Uh, and then the third thing to do is we're going to get into our auxiliary lifts, which would be either Good, um, a maintenance squatting type movement, a, a lunge type movement to make sure our hips and pelvis, is o our hips and pelvis open up really well, uh, or an upper body type movement such as a push-pull, so we'll do a pull-up or a, a pressing exercise to make sure upper body or axial skeleton can uh, may, you know, have good integrity. Quentin Payne works really, really hard in the weight room. Um, another young man is Franco House. Uh, he's a freshman. I uh, didn't expect it. He came in and told me that, you know, he did lift weights in high school. As you could tell, he's a big, big guy. But I really didn't expect him to work as hard as he has over this, you know, over this year, uh, course of the year. Chris Bond is a really good worker. Uh, he's that quiet kid. You never expect him to work as hard as he does. But he gets in, he knocks out his workout every single time he comes in. Um, he's just a really good, hardworking kid. Rob singles out a couple of guys there. I want to go to Franco House, though, in mm -hmm. particular, because he came in, and he was a bigger guy. Mm -hmm. And I was in the weight room uh, getting some workouts in over the course of the summer, and he would come in and out. And, I mean, it looked like somebody had poured a bucket of water on the guy. Yeah. He was soaked in sweat. I mean, the work that he put in yeah. was evident then, and it's evident now because he looks tremendous down the stretch of his first season. Oh, he did. You know, he's very strong, and everybody has different needs in the weight room. But Franco's gone from, I think he was around 15 and 15 percent body fat when he showed up, and now he's under 10. He's at around uh, 7 and a half or 8, and that, that's hard to do. That's changing your lifestyle off the court with what you eat. It's changing the way you work every day. Really got in great shape. Came in, I wasn't in very good shape. And he's moving better. He jumps better. He's playing better. And I still think has a lot of room for growth in, uh, in the weight room. Roberson talked about this too. I want to ask you also though, you've told some people before that it's still important that you guys lift during the season mm -hmm. as if there's almost an expectation from the outside that you wouldn't. Why is it important that you do lift during the season? Well, when you, we lift twice a week all season long and we never miss, ever. And, uh, and the reason is is that your, the, the guys that get heavy legs or tired legs late in the season are usually the ones that don't lift. And, and you're, I believe that the, the numbers behind it is every week you don't lift, you lose 10% of your strength gains that you would have made in the off season. So you go a few weeks without lifting and the work you put in in June, July, August, September, really your advantage of doing it goes away. So we, we make sure we lift all season and to me it puts you in the best position to play your best basketball when it matters most. We go from there to a guy that will spend a lot of time with Jason Roberson when he gets here over the summer. It's our next recruit profile. We can talk about guys that have signed their national letters of intent already. We've already done one of the two Arsenal Tech players. That was Jeremy Tyler a couple of weeks ago. Rashawn Richardson is in our spotlight this year. Six foot seven. He is a skinny guy, so you'll put some meat on those bones, I'm sure, but certainly a talented guy who's sprung up. He's grown a lot in the last few years, and that makes him have an interesting skill set. He's, a, he's an interesting player. You know, he was a 5'10 point guard when he showed up to high school and actually did, got cut when he was a freshman. 
and uh, now he's six foot seven. He's still about 185 pounds, so he's going to need Coach Robes. And uh, but it's just he's a terrific athlete. And he's highly skilled. He's been battling some knee and some quad injuries this year, so he hasn't had the, quite the senior season he's wanted to. But he's uh, he's really talented and probably has as much potential as any player we've had here in Muncie in a long time. So it's our job to help him meet that potential. And I know you love the story about how he hurt his elbow. Yes, I, I went down <laughs> to see him in a, in, a, in a workout here in the fall, and I looked, and he had a cut on his elbow. And he was walking around with a, a bandage trying to stop the bleeding, and I said, hey, Rashawn, you know what happened? He told me he cut his elbow on the rim, which was verified to me by the coaching staff there. I couldn't believe it, but no, he's, he's that kind of player. He can touch the top of the square. He's 6'7". He's got like a 6'10", 6'11", wingspan. He runs, he jumps, he's... He's skilled. He can handle it. He used to be a point guard, and um, he's got a really, really bright future for us. Those are the kind of difference makers that you see in and around this league as well with that length, with those guys that kind of spring in and, and bloom mm -hmm. late as well. Should be an, a, a nice, interesting uh, advantage for you guys as he gets to Muncie and develops. Let's bring it back to the here and now, though, and look at the games that are in the future for you this week. It's Western Michigan and Central Michigan. I feel like you played two games once, though, but you, you right. got to see them again. Let's start mm -hmm. with Western, second time through with them as well. You went on the road the first time, showed really well going to University Arena. You have to have confidence coming back home for match two. Yeah, I think our, our, our team really respects Western. You know, they, um, I, I, I view them being a little bit like Akron as one of the team that's been a mainstay in this conference for a long time. They're a very hard playing team, very well coached team. I think they have a real kind of blue collar identity and uh, should be a great battle here. They've won seven consecutive, nine of their last 10 as well. When you watch film of them from the last time you've played them, where have they gotten better? They, um, to me, they, they're getting better on the defensive end of the ball and then they're playing really, really well together. They got a freshman in the starting lineup now who's playing a bigger role and they've gotten really comfortable with each other and they're probably share the ball as well as anyone in the conference. David Brown there is on a tear for them scoring the basketball. He has scored 20 points in five of seven. He did a pretty decent job on him and, and Shane Whittington as well. Even though he had 21, it was a hard 21. And you just have to make sure that you can kind of push him out as, as you would with any big man. Don't yep. let him get deep catches. In right. The Those are the shots right there inside of three or four feet that we got we to gotta keep away from him. Did cause some turnovers in the game, though. We did. We, we actually double teamed him a little bit late and he um, he, we turned him over a few times and was able to kind of uh, not only get a stop but ignite our offense through his turnover. You mentioned how good they have gotten or how much better they have gotten on defense. Western, quietly or not quietly, 71st in the country now in scoring defense and uh, over the seven game win streak as well. It's impressive victories. They're not just beating anybody. They've knocked down Ohio twice. They've also beaten Akron. So uh, they are certainly on a roll. Steve Hawkins, Western Michigan Broncos again, seven straight and nine of 10. That game is Wednesday night at seven o'clock inside Worthen Arena. You go from that to Central Michigan. Mm -hmm. I could ask you if you watch them on film, how much did they change? But you've only got two games to right. watch on film. They won't change a lot. What will change is, uh, you know, we'll both try to address the things they did well against us and we did well against them. So both teams will tweak a few things certainly during the game. And uh, this is that time of year where, where uh, teams can game plan quite a bit from game to game because we all know our systems and everything well enough that we can we can make minor adjustments easily. Do you like seeing a team so quickly? Um, yeah, I do. I, I think it, it, it creates for some in interesting uh, game plan adjustments during the course of the game, makes it easier for our guys to remember the original game plan. You go uh, against a team that played defense a little bit interestingly uh, against you, and that's you talked about adjusting to the things that they did, the man right. versus zone question from what you expected and what you got the first time. Yeah, they, they had played a lot of zone prior to our game, and I think you know one of the things about our team is Xavier has really deep shooting range, and uh, he's a great three-point shooter, and he can shoot it from deep, so that, I'm guessing that's their logic behind it, but they went predominantly man-to-man -man against us, which, uh, which surprised me a little bit. It's also senior day for you guys against Central Michigan on Saturday as well. Senior day is an always bittersweet moment for a coach because there's some guys that you wish were not seniors. You wish you could have them for four more years, but yeah. at the same time, there's the understanding that you come to college to leave college and, mm. and you're saying goodbye to a group of five guys that um, are going to graduate and go on and, and do some pretty tremendous things. Yeah, I'm, I'm proud of all of our seniors. You know, one thing you can say about all of them is, is uh, they're all on pace to graduate this spring, every single one of them. And, and uh, you know, they've represented us well as a university here on the court, off the court, and we'll all be in position to be successful when they leave here. It's a hard 
thing for this senior class as well because they've come in and they've laid the foundation, which mm -hmm. is hard work. Mm -hmm. And it's not always pretty, but you're always thankful to that group as a, as a coach when you come in and you're trying to change a culture and they buy in and that helps turn things around for you. Yeah, and I, I'm hoping that, they, that our, our, our guys coming in and down the road can really pick up from where a guy like Chris Bond, for example, how much he's improved during his career here, how hard he worked in the past summer, and him seeing the benefits of that individually and for our team. And hopefully that, you know, uh, the young guys will watch that and they'll be able to pick up on that and learn from him and, and uh, try to do the same thing next summer. Five seniors for the Cardinals on Senior Day Saturday. I'm going to forget now that I'm going to go through them all, but Tyler Cook, Majuk Majuk, Kendon Crowder, Chris Bond, Jesse Berry. There you go. That was pretty good. That and Matt Kamenicki good. next year is a senior. He'll be back next year, so he gets Matt Kamenicki Day on a Senior Day 2015. Uh, but again, it's Wednesday night, Western Michigan, and then Saturday at 2 o'clock, they'll take on Central Michigan as well. Big week for you guys with Best of Luck. Appreciate it very much. We're down the home stretch for Mid-American Conference basketball. Just four games remaining in the regular season. We're back to break down the next two and preview the final two next week here on the James Whitford Show.